Hello, my name is Nathan. Thank you so much for watching and welcome to my channel. This is Twilight Zone Tuesdays and it is the BookTube edition. So if you are not familiar with what I'm doing um, on Tuesdays, then I am looking at a different episode of the classic Twilight Zone television series from the late 50s, early 1960s, and I'm having discussions about the episode with my brother. Um, so I've basically chosen 13 of those episodes, just ones that I really, really enjoy, and then we're having a discussion about them. But then in addition to that, a companion series that I'm doing, it is looking at some of the original short stories that got adapted into Twilight Zone episodes. So I've got this book, and it is Twilight Zone, the original stories. Most of the Twilight Zone episodes, if you're not if you're not familiar with this, were original teleplays by Rod Serling, who is the host of the show. But there's still quite a few that were based off of short stories, and they typically were short stories, like horror, sci-fi, short stories that appeared in various anthologies and magazines and things like that in the 1950s, early 1960s. So what I'm looking at this week is The Howling Man by Charles Beaumont. So he originally published published this short story in 1959, in November of 1959, as best I can tell. And then it got turned into an episode of The Twilight Zone, which is season two, episode five. And that one appeared, um, it first aired on November 4th, 1960. The other interesting thing with this is that Charles Beaumont, he wrote the teleplay because some of them, then Rod Serling took the short story and then he did the adaptation for the Twilight Zone series. But with this one, then Charles Beaumont, he adapted it himself. So the actual episode, it stars H.M. Winant and John Carradine. And there's some really interesting changes that happened with the television episode compared to the short story. So the short story itself is just under, it's like maybe 17, 18 pages in this book. So it's not terribly long, but... Um, it's an interesting case of, I think, the writer did a better job the second time he got a shot at this story. So Charles Beaumont, the, you know, like I say, he wrote the short story, then adapted it into the television episode. And I think that the television episode, there's changes that he made to the story from the original short story. And the changes make it much, much better. Um, there, there's a number of them that make it a lot better. The short story is good. It's not a bad short story. And the writing itself is quite good. Um, so on a, a level of the prose, it's quite good. The dialogue is fine. I think he does a better job with the dialogue in the TV episode. It's more succinct. It's economical. It's getting directly to the point. And this story kind of meanders for a fair bit until you actually get into the what is really the thrust of the episode of the twilight zone episode which is this debate of how do you know who do you trust in this story do you trust the monks who are insisting that they have captured the devil himself and they've imprisoned him or do you believe the howling man who's in the actual prison cell and the Within the short story, though, you don't get into that whole question until the last few pages of the short story. And I'm not quite sure why that is, but I can tell you that I do think that Beaumont has done a much better job with the Twilight Zone episode than this, just in terms of pacing with the story. So the other thing, too, to notice that there are significant changes between the short story and the episode is that... Um, the within the episode, you've got a frame narrative. Within this short story, you don't. Within the episode, you see the Howling Man turn into the, you know, the what can be unmistakably the devil, right? The devil himself with the cloak, and you get this wonderful editing where you have the visual obfuscation where you can't uh, or, or visual obscurity where you can't see him and then like each time he passes by one of these pillars he becomes more and more um, visually like the the classic visual of the devil right sprouting horns and getting the goatee and, and all of that and he's got the cloak on and in this you don't get that at all so 
towards the end of the short story, then when he ultimately, um, our protagonist, lets him out of the cell, he then escapes with him. The monks are not chasing after them at all. He has no idea whether it's the devil or whether it was just a guy who was imprisoned against his will by these monks. He doesn't actually know it until towards the end of the the story. So years later, then he starts to recognize the this figure, and this is um, basically the the last page of the short story. He says um, that he could not forget, as in he could not forget what the man looked like when the pictures of the carpenter from. Uh, Brownow am in began to appear in all the papers. I grew uneasy for I felt I'd seen this man before. When the carpenter invaded Poland, I was sure. And when the world was plunged into war and cities had their entrails blown asunder and that pleasant land I'd visited became a place of hate and death, I dreamed each night. Each night I dreamed until this week. A card arrived from Germany. A picture of the Moselle Valley is on one side showing mountains fat with grapes and the dark Moselle wine of these grapes. On the other side of the card is a message. It is signed, Brother Christophorus, and reads and reads and reads, Rest now, my son, we have him back with us again. In other words, our protagonist of the short story doesn't really know if it's the devil himself, doesn't know when he releases him from the cell, he allows him to escape, doesn't know for years, and then, I can't read this any other way, that this, you know, the carpenter invaded Poland, that he's talking about Hitler, that this man who was imprisoned takes on the, um, becomes, takes takes on this identity of Hitler, and the reason that World War II ultimately ended is because the monks have recaptured him, and he's now in the that cell again. So, like I say, there's no frame narrative in this because in the Twilight Zone episode, it begins where our protagonist has captured him. He's explaining to his housekeeper or whoever she is that, you know, she cannot um, open the door, not for any reason. Don't let him escape that he finally captured this guy. He gives her the whole story. And then at the end of it, then he says, you know, and that's my story of how I came to meet the devil. I didn't recognize him. I released him and that I've been hunting him down ever since and I recaptured him. That's so much more interesting than what we get in the short story here. And the short story, like I say, is not bad, but this is a an interesting case of if the writer getting another kick of the can did a much better job with his own short story. And I don't know if it's because he adapted it for television, if that's what made it better, um, or if he got notes from Rod Serling or somebody else working for the show to introduce the idea of the frame narrative to make the protagonist aware immediately that he has released the devil because like I say in this and there's just the doubt did he didn't he he's not sure until years later when he starts to recognize the face and then he doesn't even recapture him so he really is not doing much in this um, short story which is um, interesting I do want to point out though that there are some really the writing itself is really nice. It's, it's lovely writing at times. And so I'm going to read just a couple passages just to give you a sense of this. So this is from the very beginning of the short story. And it says, The Germany of that time was a land of valleys and mountains and swift dark rivers, a green and fertile land where everything grew tall and straight out of the earth. There was no other country like it. Stepping across the border from Belgium, where the rain-caped mustache guards saluted, grinning like operata soldiers, you entered a different world entirely. Here the grass became as rich and smooth as velvet. Deep, thick woods appeared. The air itself, which had been heavy with the French perfume of wines and sauces, changed. The clean, fresh smell of lakes and pines and boulders came into your lungs. You stood a moment, then at the border, watching the circling hawks above, and wondering a little fearfully how such a thing could happen. In less than a minute, you had passed from a musty ancient room through an invisible door into a kingdom of winds and light. Unbelievable. But there at your heels, at your heels, clearly in view is Belgium, like all the rest of Europe, a faded tapestry from some forgotten mansion. I think it's really lovely descriptions. Um, the prose itself is, is quite good. Uh, it's just, it's more the plot where I'm saying, 
I don't like the lack of the, the frame narrative. I think it does work better in the episode seeing him turn into the devil and the, the focus of it that you get pretty quickly into the, the, the real question here is who do you trust? Do you trust the man in the cell or do you trust these monks? Because the monks are kind of coming off as crazy and the guy in the cell is not. Uh, the other thing too, and I thought this is a nice little uh, moment where he, he says... Um, this is at the bottom of page 121 of my edition. And it's talking about how this, the man in the cell, he's howling and howling and howling. And all of the monks in this, um, in this uh, monastery, they've become so accustomed to the sound of screaming that the silence is actually uh, the thing that throws them off. And so he has a great way of describing it. He says, he was very tired sound had in these years reversed for him the screams had become silence the sudden cessation of them noise the prisoner's quiet talk with me had awakened him from deep slumber now he nodded warily and i saw that what i had to do would not be difficult after all indeed no more difficult than fetching the authorities so ultimately what he decides to do is he instructs the man in the cell to continue howling as he releases him because as as um Beaumont describes sound reverses for the monks right and for the the that one monk in particular the abbot uh, that silence sounds like noise and the howling of the noise sounds like silence he's just become so accustomed to it and you, and I'm sure you've experienced this before that if you've ever had somebody who's fallen asleep while they're watching TV and the sound will be playing and the sound will be playing and they'll continue to sleep. But if you turn it off, then the sudden silence wakes them up. That's essentially it. But it's a really nice description that he has in there. Um, and then I'm trying to think if there's one other thing. Oh yeah. And this is the last thing that I thought was works really well in the short story. When he, our protagonist goes to Mr. Ellington, um, our protagonist, when he goes to retrieve the key from the abbot to be able to unlock the cell, because in the short story, you don't have the, the staff of truth um, that's blocking the, the cell door. It's just a regular key. And so that's why I'm saying the second crack that he gets at this story in the Twilight Zone episode just a year later, having that idea of... You've got the staff of truth that's the only thing holding this man in the the prison cell like that we come to know is the devil then ellington says to him he's like well why don't you just like reach your arm out and grab it because he could easily do that so why don't you do that what's he he becomes very suspicious but because you've got the monks who are approaching that he knows he doesn't have much time so he can't really get into this debate so he ultimately just lifts it but in this, it's a regular lock. So that's why I'm saying the second time he wrote this for the for television, I go, that actually is a better choice than just a regular old lock on this. But this is what he has in the, the short story. It says, Slowly, cautiously, I lifted out the leather thong and was a bit astounded at my technique. No Ellington had ever burgled, yet a force not like experience, but like it, ruled my fingers i found the knot i worked it loose the warm iron key slid off into my hand so the the abbot the monk has got the key on this leather thong around his neck so ellington goes to retrieve it and then he's saying i've never stolen anything like i'm not a pickpocket i'm not a thief and no one in my family because he comes from a very well-off family no one in my family has ever managed to like has ever done this right as best he can tell but then I was so good at it. And he's saying it was a, a skill not like experience. He says, yet a force, sorry, not a skill, yet a force not like experience, but like it ruled my fingers. So in the discussion that I have with my brother, then we talk about, because um, my brother Tyler suggested that what happens is like, do you think, he was asking me the question of, do you think that the devil contrived a scenario uh, to be able to get Ellington into the monastery that he he was kind of working forces as best he could he didn't have enough strength to be able to release himself from the cell but he was still trying to orchestrate a scenario in which he could be released but in the short story it's very obvious here that that's what's happening 
uh, that Ellington is saying, yet a force, not like experience, but like it ruled my fingers, I found the knot, I worked it loose. That he's saying, I shouldn't be good at this, but I've got this force that's kind of guiding me, that's helping me to get the key to be able to release this guy. And I think that's the short story version of Ellington should have been tipped off. He should have realized, mm, there's something more going on here. It, I'm doing something that I shouldn't be that good at, and yet it's easy for me, and it feels like there's a force that's helping me with this. Uh, it seems like there's maybe something supernatural that he should have caught, that kind of influence there. That's really the all that you have, though, with the short story in terms of, you know, he should have noticed that. Um, and so... In general, like I say, it takes a while before you do ultimately get to that whole question of, you know, who do you trust, that much of the story is going over how beautiful Germany was in this previous time. And um, overall, I think that the television episode, even though you've got less dialogue, you get more story out of it and you get a better ending a more satisfying ending and the protagonist is actually doing something the protagonist is acting as a protagonist and in this not so much so it's an interesting case of looking at this and then saying oh the twilight zone episode is actually better than the short story and i think sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't happen but um in any case, if you have read the short story before, um, then please let me know what you think and comparing it to the TV episode, because it is one of my favorite Twilight Zone episodes. And then as a short story, I'm like, mm, it's okay. It's, it's not, I don't think it's a particularly great short story, um, but the Twilight Zone episode I think is quite good. So it's interesting how the same writer getting a second crack at his own story, but then adapting it into a teleplay does a much, much better job. And I don't know enough of the history of The Twilight Zone. I don't know if anyone can comment on that of um, how much influence Rod Serling or maybe some other writers or producers had from the short story writers who then turned these things into teleplays how much influence there was to adapt it to a Twilight Zone episode because I'm kind of wondering about that. I'm saying, did Beaumont just, when he had a second chance at this story after it had already been published, did he just do a better job the second time? Or was there something else, like somebody else who helped pull it along? Um, in any case, it's something to, to consider. And if anybody can help me out with that, that would be great. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.